What is going on? Welcome to the latest episode of the Decoders of Truth podcast, episode 11. That's right. We've actually done 11 of these suckers. Um, I'm joined by my good friend and co-host tonight, of course, Rex Bear of The Leak Project. And then, of course, we're also very excited to welcome onto the show, I think this is her first podcast and live broadcast from the Decoders of Truth, Penny Bradley. Penny has an amazing story, which we're, of course, going to get to tonight. But first of all, Penny, welcome to the show. How are you? This is my first ever podcast, my first time ever being recorded on a video. And the butterflies are finally starting to settle. Awesome. That's awesome. So. Well, we're so excited to have you on the show tonight. Obviously, your comments inside the Decoders of Truth. Um, have been, you know, a firestorm of controversy, so to speak, for sure. You have an amazing story. We're going to get to that in a second. Um, but, you know, as I told Rex, um, you fascinated me from the beginning because, you know, I'm a big student of this. I also have kind of an encyclopedic mind from a standpoint. I've read more than 500 books on the esoteric. I really have done my homework. I've been reading for 20 plus years. And you're one of the few people and, of course, I've told Rex this, that truly has an, a, a, a grasp of this information um, unlike very many people um, that I've come across. So again, credit to you. Um, like I said, we're going to talk mm -hmm. about your story in a second. Um, Rex, any comments before we jump into her story? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm just looking through your testimony that you left on the Decoders of Truth. And a lot of times when I've talked to people that have gone through certain MK Ultra, My Labs type experiments and programs, they've got certain memories that they can, you know, just basically latch on to at any time and go back and think about. And they have much better memory than many people that haven't gone through certain experiences. It seems like when people have their minds fractal, they're essentially just broken open because of these horrific experiences that you talk about, uh, you know, it creates these altered personalities, which have altered memories and makes some people have literally photographic memories. Do you have a photographic memory? I have close to photographic. Mm -hmm. I, I get between 85 and 95 percent. Um, and why I can't get that other to 5 to 10, 15 percent, I don't know. Um, but it made the difference between A's and B's in college. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I had to really work to get the, get the A. Um, I do have fractals still, um, the, the, um, we call them altars. It's, I had one come up about two weeks before I made the post in decoders, um, I still refer to her as another person because we're not completely merged yet, but we are together. So the memory is starting to come together. Um, I started merging altars a long time ago. I spent a lot of time in therapy trying to merge altars that I didn't know what, what, what caused them. So this has been a lifetime process for me to get my story this complete. Um, it's really fallen together in the last four or five years. And um, in January of 2015, I had regression hypnosis with someone who had been trained by Dolores Cannon. Um, so we didn't do the go back and get memories. What we did was I had a list of questions that the hypnotist asked my higher self. And so I, that's how I got the knowledge that I was actually a Melabs hybrid. 
that because I had had these weird dreams for years of of being in the womb and seeing another baby with me and this other baby was dead. Um, I had had dreams of being with with other small children like myself in in like a lab setting. Um, my partner is here. He's going to be wandering in and out in the background. His, his name is Lou Rist. So. Yeah, Lou's in the Decoders of Truth. Yeah. Um, yeah bring him, feel free to bring him on. He went upstairs. He doesn't want to be. <laughs> um, he may by the time we're done. Um, he nope. has... He has. Let me, just, let me just stop you real quick, Penny, because I want to give a bigger, broader summary of who you are and everything on the show. I know kind of Rex <laughs> asked a really good question and got you in, and I know you're a little nervous right now. That's okay. Um, so just to set everybody up who's going to watch this, because again, you know, and Rex will probably blast this out, and he's got hundreds of thousands of people to watch his stuff. So um, you wrote a post in the Decoders of Truth, basically mm -hmm. coming out, admitting that you were a MyLabs uh uh, you know, what, what would you call, uh, classify? I'm sorry, a, uh, a twin, right? A my labs twin. Is that is that? Um, what what I was. Military labs were creating resources. Okay. That's the best thing I can call them. Okay. Um, they do not consider me a human being. They consider me a lab rat and a very very expensive piece of property. Right. So from there, and you're going to tell your whole story in a second, again, just to try to set everything up. You um, were, um, go ahead. From the time that uh, before I was even born, my mother had been abducted and all of her children, as far as I know, are all Melab's properties. We were genetically altered to have certain abilities that Melabs was looking for. Um, in the course of President Eisenhower trying to deal with the three alternative versions presented by the Jasons during his administration, he found out that at least one ET group was terraforming the planet for their purposes. And the United States was technologically unable to do anything about it. So Me Labs, one of their things was to create a hybrid who could survive the terraforming. I'm one of those. Okay, so you, you mentioned your brothers or your sisters. Or, or how many brothers and sisters do you have? I have five living siblings and there was one that was miscarried okay and do you regularly communicate with them are they aware at all of this they are absolutely without a clue without a clue okay completely and totally in the matrix and they think i'm insane right and, and when they hear that when they hear this they are going to do a total denial of me right Right. So, so you've had, so that, so that begs the question. So you've obviously had conversations with them um, about this and they asking them if they recall or remember anything and they just are in abject denial. Uh, no, I've talked to them about psychic experiences and they were in absolute abject denial. Um, but we are all very similar in some ways. Um, we all have small birth defects. We are all O positive children of an of a O negative mother. Um, we're all very high intelligence. Um, where where are they? Are they are they in North America? Are they close to yes. you? Yes, they're in North America, and we're scattered all over the West. Okay. Um, I have a brother I haven't had contact with since ninety two. Are, are you comfortable uh, mentioning where you are, or do you want to not say that? I'm in Northern California. That's That's close. what I was going to say. So <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, I mean, that's public knowledge in the Decoders of Truth. Rex, what are your thoughts? 
Yeah, I'd like to jump back to some of the experiences you remember when you were going through the the chair, the Montauk experiments. How much detail do you have in that? And please share it with us if you would. Thank you. Um, I was four when they had abducted me. It was the summer before I would have started kindergarten. So I was this itty bitty toddler when they took me. And I was so, I was taken to Langley to, to the base there. And I was there for five years. And during that time, I was taken to Montauk to be trained in the chair. And I couldn't have been more than five or six. I was so tiny that they had to put a, this box, huge thing, in the chair to make me tall enough for the electrodes in it to hit me. So were they electrocuting you essentially in the chair? Um, the chair has points that have to make impact for it to work. Yeah, it, it's in, it uses electromagnetic radiation. Um, you are strapped in tightly and when they start the waves, your psychic ability controls what the chair does. And the flashbacks I have of it are these just rings that are coming at me in, in a wave pattern. And in the center, I can see the target where I'm going and I I was told stay in the center because if you go to the edges you can get lost and that's how they lost a lot of kids was they didn't stay in the center um, where did they I, take you for the first place you remember going um, I remember going to a place in the late 1800s and I wasn't there very long, but what I, it was, it was what we today would call a grocery store. And on the outside, they had these wooden baskets, um, um, bushel baskets full of apples. And they had them stacked, really pretty. And I was supposed to bring back one apple, and I wasn't allowed to eat it. <clears throat> so when I got back, I had my apple in hand, and then they apparently sent somebody else to put it back. So, um, you were like Eve, huh? You were like Eve. You wanted to buy it from the forbidden apple. Well, I was a kid. <laughs> That's but, awesome. <laughs> you know, was so, 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 re so real quick, Penny, Zechariah Lang just joined us. Zach, say hi to Penny. Hi, Penny. Nice to meet hi, you. Nice Sorry to meet to you. Sorry to jump in late, having trouble no, with the email. Yeah, no worries. It's probably, it's probably, who knows? It's probably me, man. My apologies. I know I sent it to your wrong email at the first one. But anyway, Penny's stories, we're just going to let her keep going. It's pretty fascinating. Rex and I are not, not grilling her yet, but I'm sure we will. But so, so go from there. I want you to, um, I want you to progress to let's say where you were 10 years old, Penny, or get into, get into um, what you next remember. How, how's that? Actually, I w wanted to talk about what they did at Langley. Because yeah, Langley, great. Please do, please. Langley is where they created the altars. Um, okay, that's where they tortured you. Is that what you're th saying? That's where they tortured me, yes. Um, there were these constant tests of psychic ability and to split me, they did the drowning like they show in the Stranger. Montauk. Yeah, Stranger Montauk Things. Chronicles. They do it in Stranger Things too. <clears throat> it was the drowning. And then whenever I didn't perform well enough on the psychic tests, they would electrocute me. And who, who How was intense doing would this? that get, Penny? Yeah, I, I have the question. Who is doing this to you? Who? I can't remember the face of the person. But it was, it was a human being for sure, correct? It was a human being, um, a presumably normal human being with absolutely no compassion whatsoever. In fact, um, 
he enjoyed the terror. He enjoyed inflicting terror on small children. And um, I was not given the monarch training, but I was done with the daisy, the daisy chain game where that they pull the petals out of the daisy and if it comes up, loves you not, they shoot you. Now, did, did you see people around you get shot or did you ever get close to any pets or anything like that and then they kill them in front of you? Did you have to go through any trauma like that? I don't consciously remember it if I did. Um, I've had pets since I was home that disappeared and we'd find their bodies later. And I'm hoping it's not related. But um, I, was a, I was in the hands of these people for five years. And I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. So it would just be for like the weekend? You'd go uh, just be a few hours no, a day? No, they kidnapped me when I was four. And they kept me there. I was a prisoner in a section that looked like a hospital and I was there. So, I mean, it's the same story of stranger things, as you know, Rex, they have, remember they have like hospital oh, yeah. board rooms. Um, that, that's, that's what it was like. I was, I was there. And the only times I wasn't there was when they took me to Montauk. So let me ask and you this. Were you, back. were you ever around other children like yourself, where you you where they, they they put you together to see if there was any kind of connectivity or social interaction, or were you always isolated? I was mostly isolated, and a lot of the playtime was to see if we could keep a secret. We weren't supposed to talk about what we were doing, but. They did find, they were testing me to do remote viewing and I can do it. I'm just not good at it. Um, I don't get the clear picture that some of the other kids got. So, so did, did, I got electrocuted a lot. Let me, let me ask you this. Did they ever explain to you like in a classroom setting with other, you know, M lab kids like you, why you were there, why, you know, you were chosen to be there, what your gifts were. And was there ever an explanation given to you for what was going on whatsoever? Or did you just have to figure out this all out yourself? There was not a organized explanation. It was specific tasks were given to you and you were told they were a game. But if you didn't perform well enough, you were electrocuted. They did decide... When I get angry enough, I can fry electronics at a distance. And I'm really a lot like Olivia in Fringe. So I, t I tend to identify with that series. And no, I've not seen Stranger Things. So um, Let me jump in if I can real quick. I was just going to ask about the uh, games that they told you to play. You said they tried to get you to do remote viewing. You weren't very good at it, and sometimes they would shock you. Can you tell us about these situations? Just give us a description. I mean, paint the picture for us, if you would. I was in a room that was very antiseptic and white walls and lots of bright light over the table and I would be shown photographs of places or people or I would be given coordinates from a map and not shown the map and told to draw what I saw. And, or to read the person's mind and tell them what I, what the person was thinking and 
it wasn't always in English. And if it wasn't in English, I didn't have a clue at that point. Um, it was being dumped into testing without parameters, without knowing what the goal was. Looking back on it and knowing what I know from research, I know they were testing what my abilities were. But like Olivia, most of my really good abilities come out when I'm scared. Can you explain, can you explain that? Um, I almost have to be in sheer survival mode to be able to access the frying electronics and reading people's minds at a distance and, and knowing what someone is going to do ahead of time. I have to be really basically terrified to be there. It's like, it's like there's a doorway to access my abilities, and I have to be scared enough to go through the door. Well, hey, can I... That was a part of your training. Sorry, Zach, go ahead. Go ahead, Zach. Go ahead, you actually got it. No, I was just going to say that's a part of your training, what they put you through, this, those traumatic experiences. So in order to activate your sixth mm -hmm. sense, your higher abilities, they freak you out to the point of this fight or flight mode and bang, that's how it's triggered. So that would make sense. But apparently that's the way a lot of us are, is we have to be terrified to be able to use them. Um, in the last couple of years... I've learned to be able to use some of those abilities to heal rather than do harm. And so that's, that's for me, that's been redeeming the experience, is now I can heal people at distance rather than do harm. Because I never want awesome. to hurt anybody. <laughs> yeah, that's completely awesome. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense because when you're scared or you feel emotions like that, I feel like parts of your brain become more active, especially in a fearful state. Uh, maybe it's triggering, triggering something inside of you that gives you those, uh, a more harnessing ability to use those uh, powers within you. Um, I do have a question. Those, that sounds super interesting. I was wondering if you can maybe share a story or like an instance where you did have to use um some of your ability is out of fear like if you can describe one of the situations you know maybe you where you did fry you know like a microwave or something around you is, is there um, a story that you can that you can let us know about there was one episode about just about a year ago when I was pulled in my sleep to do a mission and I woke up in the middle of it and um, it was a factory where they were building cyborg robots and I don't know why my team was sent there but I got so angry because these were abducted people. They were not volunteers and they were being dismantled and merged with robotics. And I got so angry, I fried the entire factory. Wow. So. <laughs> Penny, you're, this story is so good. If it's okay with you, with your permission, I wanna go live on Facebook here in a minute and just let people hear so that they can also react and ask questions. It's not going to in, impede on us. And Rex has a lot of questions for you. Uh, but I just feel that this story needs to get told and more people need to hear this. Um, so if you can, and again, I don't want to interrupt or impede, but I'd like to hear your whole story from where you're at now. Okay, Langley at four, five, six, seven, eight, to, 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 to you know, take, us, take us to now. So, you know, wherever okay. you're from there. Okay, from... From Langley, I was taken through a jump gate that looked like an elevator to a German colony on Mars. 
and I don't, I can't remember where it was. Um, I can't look at a map of Mars and find it. But I know it was underground, and I went to Shula for 10 years. Um, that altar speaks fluent German and very little English. And when I graduated, I was technically, officially U.S. Navy. And I usually wore a U.S. Navy uniform. Um, but I was on loan to Mars Defense Force. And um, I was a lieutenant. And I flew fighter planes, and my job was to find nests of the native green reptilians on Mars and take them out because they were, humans are their favorite food, I'll just put it that way. So they were a really big threat. We were at war with them. Um, the whole time I was there. You really don't want to mess with them. They're seven feet tall and they have claws that will gut you in one swipe. So you don't want to be unarmed around them. Um, do, do they use weapons or, or I'm assuming they have some form of weaponry? Um, they are as intelligent as we are, maybe more so. Uh, they don't have explosives. Uh, they do have weapons uh, and natural shielding armor. A lot of our troops that are there wear exoskeletons just in case they get snagged by one of these guys. Um, God, shaking. <laughs> um, I served um 15 years on mars so how old were you at first going get it getting there and then in military and, and 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 until when you left i was nine when i went to mars i was 19 when i was put in a fighter plane i was about 35 when i was transferred to Dark Fleet. Dark Fleet is basically Nazis in space. And they're not nice people. And it's not nice what we do or what I was part of. We were shipping people and materials to colonies that humans on Earth know nothing about, and most of those people we were shipping were slaves. Um, would you be able, sorry to interrupt? Would you be able to maybe describe what what Mars looked like or what type of terrain it was? Because I think like the mainstream idea is like from what it's on the planet. Do you have any recollection of, of what the planet looked like? Did it have, was there water, was it, you know? There's not a lot of water above ground, but there is below ground. Um, you dig a little bit and you can find it. Um, there are trees. Um, they're not like the trees here in California. They're more like the trees in, in Eastern Oregon, they look more like junipers, and they're they're really they're really sturdy and survive desert cold desert conditions. But Mars itself in the daytime isn't that cold. It's seventies. So Penny, everything that NASA shows us down here about the way Mars, the red planet, and it's arid and waste and barren and all that, that's all complete nonsense and PSYOP, correct? Correct. 
Um, there's a pale blue sky unless there's a sandstorm. The sandstorms make, make it turn the orange that's in the pictures. Um, the sandstorms also create really strong static. Or I've, I've been told that they don't do it anymore, but there used to be such static storms that they would take, it would be like an EMP strike. Um, they would take out whole areas. They would, there would even be, be electrical things between Mars, the planet, and its moons. You could just watch these lightning strikes clear into space. So, so you would classify then the weather there, at least in the portion of where you were on the planet, is similar to Earth climactically? Uh, similar to Arizona in winter. Arizona in winter. That's a great, great, great analogy. Okay. So um, as far as colonies and civilization and industry and that kind of stuff, is, are there thriving, you know, metropolises there similar to Earth? Or is it just a couple of cities and underground bases? Or what would it look like from an aerial if you were on a plane, you know, 3,000 feet up? Um, there are cities, and they're mostly underground to protect from the static. Okay. Um, there are also other races there. Right. That's what my next question was. And they have their assigned territories. And for millennia, they had been fighting amongst themselves over territory. And... The Germans came in and formed colonies in the area assigned to the Alpha Draconians because they have an the Germans have an alliance with the Draconians. And so they came in, and the Draconians were much hated by everybody else on the planet. So it's like we came in on the devil's side. Everybody well, hated us. So question about the Alpha Draconians. You mentioned green reptilian, seven feet, vicious, could carry you in, uh, in half with, their, with the claw. Are they Alpha Draconians or is this a separate reptilian race? It's a separate reptilian race. So the Alpha Draconians are, are much taller and much smarter and much more psychically aware? Yes. They're, they range from 13 to 15 feet tall. The The royals and the um warrior class their worker class are smaller more our size so would you say they're engineered similar to like you were if they were engineered it was thousands of years ago wow so would you so you would classify them as far more advanced species of uh, a race of beings than we are In some ways, yes. They're a much older species. Reptilian races don't evolve quickly. They stay, stay stable over time, much more than we do. So you, said there's, so you said there's other races. I don't mean to interrupt you. There's other races on Mars besides the Draconians, besides the green reptilians. Um, who, who would they be? Um, the... The next one is E.T., and they are um, the Mantids, and um, they, are, they are really intelligent and really alien in their thought processes. So when you say really intelligent, are they complete mind readers, like completely clairvoyant and telepathic? Yeah, and they have high tech. So, so if, if a human like us, a sapiens, and you're obviously engineered, so you're higher than us, but if Zach, myself, or, or Rex came into a room with them, they would know exactly what we were thinking without us even having to think it. They would know exactly what I was thinking without me having to think it. Uh, wow. Well, let me, let me ask you one question about the, <laughs> let me ask you a question about the mantids um, and, and relay it to, and Rex, jump in here in a second, but. Dr. David Jacobs, who Rex has had on his show, who's like the foremost 
abduction researcher right now on the planet, right? There was Bud, Bud Hopkins and the other guy, and now that guy's dead and Bud's no longer here. And now David has picked up the torch and he's written three fascinating books, which I've read all of them. And he says that the mantids are the race that is in charge and that the reptilians and the greys and these other beings that are abducting humans are all following in this hierarchical, you know, level underneath the mantids. Can, is that, do you, is there anything, is there any truth to that that you, that you know of? If they're doing that, it was at a level I was, I didn't have access to. Okay. Um, my understanding was that they were competing empires. Okay. So, so are they, so are the mantids aligned with the alpha draconians? Are, are they separate? When you say they're living on Mars, are they, are they hostile towards another or are they, is there like an allegiance or is, are they kind of allied or how, how is the, what is the division? Um, the division was that the planet was, was split three ways and the, there are native Martians there and they just sort of hide. <laughs> they, so what, what type of race are the native Martians? Are they humanoid? They're humanoid. Um, they look Native American and they dress in these really billowy flowing robes that are either black or blue. That's fascinating. Um, That's fascinating. That, that show, I don't know if you saw that Rex or, or Zach. John Connor. Yeah, yeah. So the show, so the show um, that that guy Mike Para that does the Moon Show that was on, uh, you know, the same channel as Ancient Aliens. He did the Moon Show about nine or ten months ago, and they showed a body in a sarcophagus on Mars. They said it's a legit picture, and it showed what, what looked like an Aztec Indian warrior in like headdress garb, and said that this was this is a, a live mummified or, or not mummified, but being found on Mars, an indigenous Mars. So what she's saying then would make more sense if it does look Indian. Fascinating. Well, it's also neat because I actually have a video that I did about a year ago. It's a podcast. It's just a few minutes and I should probably update it where the Mars Rover picks up this footage of what you can clearly see is a carved out path that goes down to what looks like a pharaoh, a carved pharaoh into the cliff itself. And you can tell it's not weather. If you look at the surrounding of this specific outline, you can see the weather patterns, how it's from probably, you know, thousands of years of wind and rain, etc. But then if you see this perfect pharaoh that's carved around it and this path that leads down to it, you can actually see this directly high resolution if you go to the JPL website and look at it. It's incredible. And I'm thinking that maybe that's where a lot of this Egyptian type stuff, you know, it seems like it's been around a lot longer right. than just eight times essentially. So, so, um, and Zach, jump in here in a second, but so Penny to, to answer, and we're, we have already 50 questions on the Facebook live here. Pe Penny is, Penny is the number one person in the decoders of truth for sure. But, um, I will get to them in a second. I want, I want you to keep going on your story. Obviously we have so many questions. We're going to have to bring you back on another time, but, um, so, so this race, this native Martian race, um, do you believe that they're originally from Earth, or they, they seeded us here? I don't know. I never had a lot of contact with them, only saw them from a distance. Were they hostile or antagonistic towards you, or no? No. They're, they, want, they want to be non-combatants. Um, if you move into their area, they will move. They will leave. Um, the, the green reptilians, I have to really think about it because my altar calls them Lizzie's, <laughs> wow. which, which I'm sure is an insult term. That's it, what Princess Diana called her. Yeah, yeah. right? That is, true. <laughs> that is true, Rex, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's insane, man. But um, yeah, they... They like to eat the natives first. If they can catch one of the natives, that's their favorite food. If they can't catch one of the natives, then they go after humans. 
from Earth. So, so this green reptilian, and go ahead in a minute, Zach, and, I, and, and, and Rex, we will get back to what you're talking about here in a second. Um, we want to talk more about Montauk and MK, but, I, but real quick, the green reptilians. So who are the reptilians? And there's questions, and this will answer some of the questions coming from Facebook, but the reptilians that are on Earth, right? The, and you and I have talked, the Nagas. Mm-hmm. Are, they, are they related to them, or is this just a separate species that just comes from wherever they come in the universe? There is an underground race on Earth that looks very much like the reptilians on Mars. Okay. So they must be um, and, and they are known to the Native Americans as man-eaters. Um, and that's the only one of the underground races that the Native Americans avoid. Okay. But so, they're, they're very much like the ones, the green rep, the Lizzie's on, on Mars. Um, I don't know where either race came from originally because part of their propaganda is that they all came from Earth and they're older than humans, therefore the planet belongs to them. Right, right. Um, so, I, you know, Zach, you have a comment? Yeah, I was gonna, a lot of the people in the, in the dot face group are obviously familiar with the Anunnaki. I was wondering if, if they would have, if you know anything of their presence on Mars and uh, specifically relating to supposedly there's a old Nibirian king, Alalu, who had his tomb built there. Um, do, you, do you know anything about, about his tomb, maybe a, a tomb face structure on Mars in relation to him? And, and also, if you could talk about maybe the Cydonia complex that's right. supposed to be aligned with the Pleiades star system. Do you know, can you corroborate any of that? Or um, If I had anything to do with that, I, didn't, I don't remember it. Um, what I know about Cydonia and the face on Mars is from reading Sitchin. Okay. Um, sorry. No, it's okay. So, you, so you have no, so you have no knowledge of quote unquote Anunnaki, as far as in anything that you did as a as an M Labs, uh, as a as a piece of property for M Labs on Mars and your fighting and and whatnot. I have no personal experience of it. Um, I know from research that they were there during the Anlil Anki Wars, but they bombed there as well as here. So. Okay. So, so at 35, I'm just going to fast forward ahead so we can get through your life and then we can answer all these questions. And I know Rex wants to talk about MK Ultra a lot, which we'll get to, and we got a million questions. So this is going to be a great show. Um, so what happened? So 35, you've served, you, you, you've served in the military and now your tour, now your tour is up. Um, my first tour was up. I was re-upped in Dark Fleet, and I was 59 when they sent me back. They okay. As you go through all of this stuff, they fill you full of these chemicals to keep you at prime working age, which is in your 20s or 30s. Right. So. Your body looks no older than 35 the whole time you're in this service. Then when any, any time you get injured, they put you in this tank, the regeneration tank. And at least in my time, it was a tank of fluid you could, you could breathe in. And I don't know how else to explain it. It looked like one of those giant like the first stage MRI machines. It looked like that. And they'd put you in from the top and they'd leave you in there until you were healed. And then they would pull you out and hose you off and put clothes on you and send you back to work. But it could literally repair anything. Anything, anything wrong with the human body, it could fix it. And then whenever your time was up, they would set a dial on it and turn you back to what you were when they first abducted you and then time travel you back to your bed. 
So do you feel the age regression or age forwarding at all, like physiologically, other than when they dip you in the machine? Do you even feel it? Of course you feel it, but they have you knocked out while they're doing it. So, well, that's what I mean. I it's, it's, like, it's like you come out and you're like, whoa. It, it's, your body isn't right. It takes a little while to adjust to it. And usually by that time, they're putting you back in for something else. Um, life in the secret space program is dangerous. You're constantly being shot, eaten at, um, catching diseases, um, getting injured, things, or just your liver goes out from the drugs they have you on. You're constantly having something wrong. So, so when you say your liver goes out, do they just regenerate you and fix you so you don't actually die? Yes. Wow. So you can't really die unless you get eaten. As long as they can find in your brain and it's, it's intact enough to keep memory, they can bring you back. Jesus. Just think what that tech would be would do for, for people on earth, people with cancer, people with liver problems, people with kidney issues. How, how much suffering could be resolved? Rex, thoughts? I want to jump in if, if I can, and maybe we could change the, the topic a little bit unless you want to stay on this because I really want to reach out and find information about these handlers that you had. Did you just have one? And did you also have, was it like a good cop, bad cop situation? Was there somebody there that comforted you as well for those years? Um, when I came back, I was handed back to my parents for all intents and purposes. Um, they were your classic conservative, too young, white trash. Right. And um, my father was, was half Cherokee. And this was in the 19, it was, I was, I was taken and returned to 1959. This so is you don't, you, you don't this think is, they had any clue. They had no clue. Your parents had no clue whatsoever. I think my mother had been all given altars and that the altar knew because she would, she would, she, to this day, she's 78 and has memory lapses. Things, things, that I know happened and she's clueless. So I've been able to forgive her because I'm pretty sure she has alters and her main personality just doesn't know. But they, they were church. Jump in real quick though. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted you, when you were at Langley though, and do you remember there being somebody else besides just one specific handler or was it just the one person that you can remember? There were caretakers that came and went, and they were, it was like they were not allowed to get attached to us. There was no kindness. We were lab rats. My understanding from some of the people I know is that by the 1980s, they figured out kids needed some sort of affection. But in my time, they didn't we it was it was five years of being a project and it has it has changed me because i still have trouble with the with the self-worth issues and if i can ask real quick too and, and sorry to interrupt i appreciate this do you ever remember a time or the person you're are you married now or were you talking about just your boyfriend a partner We've lived together for 16 years. I've okay. been, I've been married and divorced twice. Both husbands tried to kill me. And, and we definitely want to get into that. And, and I want to ask about that in a moment, but the experiences that you've been for 16 years with the person that you're with, have, has she ever noticed a certain word trigger words, a sequence of words 
that causes you to switch authors? I, I would like to hear about the different authors that you know of that you have. Um, I had three that I was aware of and I named them. It was Penny, who was my main alter, who was my main me. And then there was Louise, who was able to survive anything. That's the best way I can describe her. And Rebecca, who just wanted to die. And I finally got them integrated together three years ago. So before, before, you, had, before you had the regression hypnosis, you figured it out? I, before I had the regression hypnosis, I knew I, I had been going to therapy for years trying to get the three of them to integrate. I mean, decades. So, I was, so when you told therapists this, did they just think you were insane or did they actually give you credibility? I never told them about me labs or MK ultra. Right. But the, the, the three people, the three separate egos or alter egos, you did tell them that, correct? Yeah. And um, they were okay with it or they just, just dismissed it. I prescribed you medication. I'll bet. Didn't they? Oh, off and on. Um, they thought I was coping pretty well and they shared memory. So I didn't have memory lapses. Um, and for DID, I was, I was functioning pretty well. I wasn't a danger to myself or anyone else. Um, they were more concerned about the occasional bouts of depression. Well, yeah, if you have an avatar that just wants to die, I'm sure that's, I mean, a threat to you and, you know, I mean, obviously. Yeah. Um, in August, uh, tail end of August, early September, was when the, the one from the Secret Space Program came up. Um, she calls herself Penelope Valkyrian. And I don't know if Valkyrian was her unit or the last name she chose to use. Uh, because the Valkyrie were flying women who attacked. So um, she was a fighter pilot, so it could have been her unit. As, but she's using it as a name now when she talks to me. So um, she's learning English faster than I'm learning German. <laughs> so we're making progress. Um, she didn't like being buried for 60 years. So. Zach, thoughts? Hmm, I'm wondering, um, we're, we're talking about, about communicating with, with, with uh, Sorry, there's a little background noise. No problem. Um, we're talking about communicating, um, like telepathy. Is that what we're talking about? Or are we talking about actual physical being? I'm kind of, I'm kind of. We're talking about I'm communicating with an altar in my own head. Okay. But it's like two people. It at this stage because we're not merged. It's similar to what most people would consider possession you have a voice in your head that's not you right are there some sort of signals that you get when you're receiving transmission or i hear her words voice it's just not physical right <clears throat> do you lose consciousness when you hear when, when one of your alters tries to connect with you or are you totally lucid and and, and aware I'm totally lucid and aware, but I don't know if I have, I, I haven't seen triggers like they're talking about. I don't have missing time. Um, when I'm taken for missions, you, it's in my sleep and I have started waking up in the middle of them. 
So are you actively being taken for missions now? Or are you done? You're decommissioned. You're, you're done. I'm actively taken. Wow. So as soon as they take you, then they age regress you again? No. Um, they take me for things that the body isn't important. Just the, just the psychic ability is. So explain, like, give us an instance. Like the one I talked about where, where my team was supposed to take out this factory. Right. Uh, it was, I was there, I did the job, and I was back. Uh, was there long enough to do it. I woke up in transport, so I don't know how long I was gone, but... It, it's hard to explain to someone who hasn't been through it, right. but okay. it's like you're never safe. Well, so if Rex and I kidnapped you, and we're not planning on kidnapping you, but if we kidnapped you and we took you to a Best Buy and we said, Penny, we want you to, to, to blow out the top level, highest level electrical um, you know, television system in Best Buy and just shut it down with your mind, could you, could you actually, do you think you could do it? I don't know. I haven't tried to do it real world. So you've never really, so all the things that you do on your missions, you've never tried them in the quote unquote modern 3D now. I was in a, an online support group. Okay. And we were talking about some of the things and there were people in the group that the electronics in their house got fried. Um, I was asked to leave the group because of this. So, um, yeah, I had to turn the video off because just that much connection would mess them up when I was getting upset. So do you feel, do you feel fear or are you afraid or worried or nervous that you're doing this broadcast, be, you know, and putting this broadcast out there in public? Cause it will be out there in the public. There's some fear. Um, I was shot with a directed energy weapon in on a trip in Nevada in July. And I've been shot through the walls in my house my apartment here twice since then. So that's part of my motivation for doing public is if they're going to kill me, I want people to know why. So what do you feel like when you're shot with a, a directed energy weapon? Like how does it feel like sens sensory wise? Like being hit with a log, except it's electronic. But does it knock you completely unconscious, senseless, or do you just feel pain? Pain. So is it like an electrocution when you were a child in the M Labs thing? Yeah, it's a lot like that. So, Except almost, there's no so they're conditioning you. It's the same mm -hmm. thing that they were doing to you as a child. They're attempting to do to you now. Yeah, they're telling me to shut up, and I'm telling them, "F you." Go ahead, Rex. <laughs> it sounds what you're talking about is a combination of the film John Carter, Firestarter and the TV series, Stranger Things. I'm yes. telling you, if you put all that together, yes, it's, it's, amazing. it's very similar parallel to what you're talking about. Now, you had some really bad experiences that you went through with your first two husbands that you explain in the Decoders of Truth Facebook page. And mm -hmm. if you could, just, you know, I mean, we don't want you to get too deep with this on things you want to talk about, but do you think they were connected to the stuff you went through when you were a child? Uh, the first husband, I don't believe so. I believe he was just immature and wasn't happy being married and didn't know how to get out of it. And he would have temper tantrums. Um, the second husband, I do believe, was related to it. Um, after... He, after we got involved, I got 
definite psychic impression that he had killed people and I asked him about it and he said that um, it was during his time in Vietnam. Well, that was a logical explanation. So I accepted it. And after we got married, it turned out that he was a mafia enforcer. And then he admitted that he had been CIA trained to kill people with his mind, that he would go in, that he could touch them skin to skin contact and enter their minds and if they had any aneurysms in their heart or brain he could kill them with it and um so i knew he was a handler and it took me 10 years to get to the point where that i didn't care if he killed me or not and that was when i divorced him because if you have a man sleeping next to you with a 38, 38 police special aimed at your head every night, you know he's serious, he's going to kill you. And it took, his thing was, if you leave me, I will hunt you down and kill you. You will be dead. And after 10 years of putting up with that and his cheating on me, and his emotional abuse. I finally got to the point where it was like, if you're going to kill me, you can do it. Sorry about the cuss. No, it's okay. But um, I'm not going to live like this anymore. And he had been poisoning me, and I was getting to where I couldn't, I couldn't think, I couldn't work. Um, the veil was getting thin. I was getting visions of, of people on the other side and visions of things from people's lives. Um, one of them was I, I was an Episcopal lay reader, and one of the visions was about my priest. Um, and then one day, this entity appeared to me and at the it was a glowing white light being with wings and said you know your lupus wasn't wasn't anything but a skin disease before you were with this guy start looking at what's happening to you and then that was what made me realize I was being poisoned, and I decided that I had to do something. I couldn't leave. I still had a kid in high school. I couldn't leave this kid in this man's hands. And then he moved his ex-wife and their kids into my house, and it was just, I heard him downstairs. Well, we had a wood stove heater with a vent up into the upstairs bedroom and I could hear him telling his daughter that when I died they were going to use the insurance money to take the grandkids to Disneyland. So I knew he was doing something but it took me it took me a year to get blood test results that showed that it was arsenic. And when the blood test came out, then my doctor put me on lecithin because by that point I was too sick for EDTA. So, um, but it took me a good three years to be able to work again. Um, I had how, been, how did you get free of him? How did I get free of him? Um, I kicked everybody out of the house that I wasn't married to or blood related to, except for his, his son that I had custody of from the court. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, I was the only, the only person, Hello. In, I was the only person Good in that time. life that had never been in jail. So the court gave him to me. So I had I had him and two of my kids and 
my husband. And then he and I fought over who was going to get to keep the house. And I finally got him to leave. And I filed for divorce with borrowed money. And he decided to fight it. So my mother, one of the good things she's done for me, sent me the money for the retainer for the lawyer. And he was, the husband was threatening to shoot me. And I looked him dead in the eyes, absolutely as cold-blooded as I could pull off. And I said, you're going to have to choose between your guns and your vengeance. That if I have to get a restraining order, you'll lose your gun permit. And he swallowed hard and said, all right, you win this round. And he moved in with his ex-wife. And he showed up at my house a couple of times. And then I ended up too sick to take care of myself because the arsenic had soaked into my bones. And I ended up moving in with Lou. And I've lived with him ever since. So he's never, he's never tried to make another appearance in your life subsequently? Um, he appeared on my Facebook wall one day, and I blocked him. But he's left me alone. He knew I, <clears throat> I can look really crazy. <laughs> um, I no can, way. I, this sounds totally normal, all of it. I, I, I can get this look in my eyes where when I say something, even a mafia enforcer believes me. So, so, so do you believe then that he was, he was aware of who you were the whole time and he was just being paid by your handlers? Yes. Okay. Yes, I do believe that. Let me jump in real quick if I can, Penny. The experiences you're talking about are nothing short of incredible i mean just absolutely astonishing if you could tell us about how you first discovered these experiences right. that would be that'd be great oh i met a man on facebook and i fell in love and he paid for me to fly to baltimore to meet him and it was like we were in a 20-foot sacred circle. And while I was with him, he tried using Wizard of Oz triggers on me. Jesus. Ooh, was he, so he was using trigger words on you. Okay. Can he you was share just, those with us or are those going to trigger you? Um, they didn't, a couple words I want to ask for all of They them. didn't trigger me the way he wanted them to. So they wouldn't trigger me, but they might trigger someone listening to the broadcast. So when you said, when you said you fell in love with him, so he was a plant again from your handlers and it was an experiment to get you to the East coast. Um, maybe he threatened to take me to Langley. Actually, he was offering to take me to Langley. He had been, he still is a Facebook friend as actually, um, but I had made a psychic connection with him before. I even read Eve Lorgan's book about um, love bites because I thought he might have been one of those. But um, we he have smart. we 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 still have a psychic connection between us. Um, he's very ill at the moment and has been getting transfusions and I feel the needles when he gets his transfusions. So, um, well, you, th you think he's an M lab rat like you? Yes. I, I think he's a, I think he's an M lab rat like me and, um, my alter Penelope remembers him on Mars. So one question I want to ask you, cause it's relevant to what we are right now. And I have so many questions and I know Rex has a bunch of, I'm sure Zach stuff too. And again, um, I echo what Rex said, Penny. This has been absolutely fascinating. I'm sitting here with like a lot of hairs all over my body standing up. Like, you know, it's, I'm in awe right now. It's, 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 a, very, it's a very harrowing story. And I'm really sad that you've had to experience this. And it's just, 
this world is a f- up place, man. I don't know how else to summarize it, but um, the question that this woman has, and there's so many, but it's very relevant. She said, are many of you, meaning your M labs cohort cohorts, are they going through life completely unaware, mind erased? And before you answer that, do you feel that that is your brothers and your brothers, or I'm sorry, your, your siblings are, this, are exactly that answer? My siblings are exactly that answer. Um, most of us, the seals held. Um, if they had not been harassing me my whole life, if they had just let me live a normal human life after they sent me home, mine probably would have held too. It's the constant harassment. And um, I was diagnosed in 1982 with systemic lupus. And when I wasn't dead in 2000, my doctor changed the diagnosis to fibromyalgia. But talking to others who have been through this, we call it age regression sickness. And it's, it's basically like, like your body's saying, whoa, you did too much. It's time. You're done. And it, it's, it's not fun. And there, there's a lot of us that have it, and it starts about 20 years after they send you back. So let me ask you this, and I know this is an estimate, estimated um, answer you're going to provide here, but if they're doing this on Mars and they've got, you know, engineered my labs, experiments and pieces of property, fighting, doing other things, do you believe or do you have any recollection or any knowledge of that they're doing this on every planet in the solar system? As far as I know, there are bases on every major moon in the solar system. Colony, there are underground colonies on Venus, and it's not as hot as they say it is. It's hot like an oven, but not as hot as they say it is. That's why the colonies are underground. Um, They still have Venus natives underground. Um, There are other beings that live on the gas giants that breathe hydrogen. So there are other kinds of life forms there that are not compatible with earth. Well, if you remember Rex, I think you've had him on a show, not the guy, but the, the, one of the researchers that interviewed him. But remember in the fifties, there was a supposedly a, a, Ven- a Venetian who came to earth named Valiant Thor and served in our political system for like three years. Didn't you interview the guy Rex that, that supposedly my great uncle. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, just kidding. Oh, no, yeah, did you of interview the guy that, that had uh, Valiant Thor or, or talked about? I did him? talked about him. Yeah, and the guy is has been kind of on the internet now for many years, and some people are wondering if it's a conspiracy or if it's legit. But I've talked to some pretty serious people that say that is legit, and I just wanted to bring up Pat Buchanan because I, Pat Buchanan's been in the military. He's very intelligent. He was a part of a program many years ago, somewhat similar to men who stare at goats. This is documented, right, you know, right, you read the white papers. And he talked about oh, one Project time. Stargate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And go. he talked about one time he went to a facility, government facility, and he saw a bunch of, you know, bunch of cookie cutter people sitting there at their desk in their cubicles, punching on a computer. And there's this one mantis alien just right there out of the blue and he looked at it like what and and he said you know what though is i kind of pinned him on that to, to get him to answer like what's going on with that and he said well it could have just been somebody in a costume but the way he said it it was so it, real right he just he just couldn't be honest but he was yeah pretty incredible so so back to what you said penny uh, and and thanks rex um so basically there's colonies on every moon 
there's mm-hmm. races, there's races, multiple, mo- multiple sentient being races everywhere. Mm-hmm. And, and all of the planets, all nine or 10 of the planets, if you believe in the 10th planet, Nibiru. I believe uh, in the 10th planet. Right. Of course you do. Uh, we all do here. But, but, but the reality is, is that you're saying that all of them have races, indigent beings, sentient beings, and they pretty they much. Don't, they don't all have, have, um, native forms okay some, some of them only have humans some of them have reptilians and humans some of them have natives some of them have there there's a base out there <laughs> there's a station outside of jupiter that's like like an interplanetary united nations there's lots of critters there. So, so all the travel then between planets, I mean, obviously we've talked about this on the decoders, you know, Rex and, and, and even Zach was on that episode. We talked about star, uh, where's it? Um, what's the movie? The, the recent uh, movie. ending. The, the most recent movie about travel, uh, interstellar, interstellar. Okay. So, so, um, so are you saying then with all these races and this travel f- to and from planets, they are using, they are bending time to travel. It's not like they're using yes. like rockets from NASA, correct? Uh, they're using Stargate technology left over from the Builder race. So the Builder race is whom? Nobody really knows. It's way before the Anunnaki were here. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, so, and, so, and they range from thirty to sixty feet tall. So that's why that's why Tellinger has that that pick that footprint that looks like a fifty foot person or a fifty foot humanoid being. Um, okay, um, this is so seventeen mind- toes. This is so mind blowing. So, so, so well, you're still. You need- you need big feet if you're going to be that size. Yeah, obviously, obviously. Well, I mean, again, if you look at, you know, Michael Tellinger's in our group, so we can give him a shout out. But his book, The Temples of the Anunnaki, you ha- you've seen it, Zach. You've seen it, Rex. There's a, he has a footprint, you know. Of, it's somewhere in the northern plains of Africa. or I, It's right north, I forget, of uh, Tanzania. And it's a monstrous footprint. And it's, it's proven that it's like literally six, they, they've carbon dated or age dated it. It's 6 million years old. Mm-hmm. So amazing, man. Um, well, I mean, we've been on right now about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, I mean, just, we're still on live on Facebook. Is there anything before we just start hit, hitting, hitting you with rapid fire questions? Is there anything else about your story that you want it to get, you want it, you want to get out right now? There's a lot more people like me out there than, than anyone guesses. So what would you estimate, and I apologize because I was going to ask that question, what would, you, what would you estimate how many people are actually out there right now on planet Earth like you? At least a million. Wow. Let, let me jump Worldwide. in. Worldwide. After. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rex. That's a lot. Now, what I want to know, please, is I don't know if this was answered or maybe I missed it, but when you were deprogrammed, essentially, you said you met somebody on Facebook, they deprogrammed you by doing the Wizard of Oz programming or Wizard of Oz code, etc. Did you have any of these memories before then? Or, and what was that? I mean, did you go, you talked earlier about hypnosis regression that you went through. Okay, I started with mostly dreams that didn't make sense um and this was just a few years ago or is this always this was like prior to five years ago okay i i had all these dreams that didn't make sense and they felt real um they felt more real than than regular life and i i couldn't make heads or tails of them so i didn't talk about them and then I met this guy, and he took me to the then new Wizard of Oz movie, the 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 series. <clears throat> no, it was it was um, it was the one where the wizard be- the the guy becomes the Wizard of Oz. It was the new movie three years ago. Oh yeah. 
And uh, he got mad at me during the middle of it and walked out and left me watching the movie by myself. <laughs> I mean, you know, I attract winners, what can I say? Um, but, um, when I came, I was fine. I didn't notice any changes until I came home and I wasn't with him anymore. Because I was, I was with him 11 days, came home, flew back, and suddenly there were weird visions, and I was lucid day and night. Um, I'm still lucid day and night unless I take something to sleep with. Um, I was in multiple dimensions at once, seeing and hearing beings that, that I had just glimpsed before, and now they were part of my daily life. And I talked to several people. Um, there was a witches group on Facebook that said I was insane, and they all blocked me. And, <laughs> and um, I ended up in a group of Gnostics, and they had me go to a lady that removes arconic implants. There you and, go, Rex. Was that and, Alexandra Metters? I don't know what her real name is. Her Facebook name is Mother God. Hmm. And... Um, she did excellent work, and she, it, I could feel the difference when she was done, and that was in October of 2014, and then it was like the visions I'd had before were suddenly on steroids, and I had all these questions, and I went to the hypnotist in the following January, January 2015. What's the hypnotherapist's name? Oh, shit. I can't remember. She was in Tracy, California. I can get you the name. Um, she, was, she was experiencing regression hypnosis. Yes. She was trained by Dolores Cannon herself. And she 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 was she actually did a really good job for a lot less money than I had anticipated. Because I know the going rate is like four hundred dollars for, for a three hour session. And she only charged me two hundred dollars and we spent almost eight hours. And then she spent an hour trying to reassure me that I was still a normal human being <laughs> because I came out of there thinking I was a freak. And um, so um, then the memories, the memory seals started popping off and mine were booby trapped with um, suicide programming and I've managed to resist that. And um, yeah. So we have a ton of questions, Penny. I'm going to ask Zach real quick before we jump into the questions. I have a lot of really good questions. Zach, um, thoughts? Man, well, Penny, I just want to say thank you You're, uh, for coming on. You're super brave for, for coming on the show and coming out with this information and sharing your story with us. Um, I do. I do. So, uh, so again, just thank you for that. And uh, Definitely. So I'm grateful to be here with you. Um, I do want to jump gears real quick, going, go, if I may, just going back to talking about all the different um, species within our solar system. What would you, what would you say is the general consensus of uh, the human species in their mindset? Are we? Um, do they want us to? 
to evolve to the point where we can integrate with them or, or are we literally, do they just want to keep terraforming us and using us as, as an experiment? What? Great question, Zach. Go ahead, Penny. Different groups have different agendas. And going to a Star Trek analogy, they see us as the Klingons. Um, we are a violent, emotional, uncontrollable species in their minds. And they hope we can eventually become part of the community. So, so do you think we're violent and uncontrollable because the Anunnaki tampered with our DNA just to fast forward us? I see the violence as being part of the Anunnaki DNA. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, um, they are more or less seen with the same eye. <laughs> right. Um, I think I mentioned in a post um, about why the Anunnaki were stuck in 3 and 4D, and it's because they're egotistical and power hungry and violent. And we share that DNA. So do you, do you agree then with Gerald Clark and various other researchers, you know, and a lot of us in the community who are very connected and close with Gerald and obviously Gerald, I don't know if you've read Gerald's books. We'll, we'll, we'll be sending them to you because you should, they're fascinating. But I mean, he's basically interconnected the ruling classes on earth. And I know where I'm going to take this question because you and I have had this conversation offline, but, he basically believes still that they're still in charge of the quote unquote elites, royal families, monarchical dynasties, whatever you want to call them, the royal bloodlines. And they're still, you know, playing games with us today. Do you agree with that? I believe that the Anunnaki are still playing games. I don't believe they're alone. Right. Um, I believe that there are alpha draconians that are also messing with us um as far as earth i see the anunnaki like state government and the alpha draconians as the feds that's kind of the relationship they have but between both of those species they're completely in charge of this planet and we are their slaves pretty much there you have and it. they are working together with each other, you would say? Or, or are they fighting for control of us individually? I personally believe that the Anunnaki that are left in bodies and working on control are insane and believe their own propaganda that they're gods. Hmm. Um, uh, if humanity does not get control of our own situation soon, uh, we may very well be facing a situation of groups being controlled by different Anunnaki going to nuclear war. Right, right. And, and I was thinking something along those lines. Um, I've seen a few videos. I can't remember any of these um higher up people in the military like you know four stars lieutenants and all these people talking about how nuclear missiles would be launched off and they would describe these ufo aircraft you know flying above it shooting a beam right. down flying below it shooting a beam down way, going yeah. On. Yeah. right and then all of a sudden they would just disable the nukes do you um do you have any idea who you think that might be um with all these different species out there um, um i mean they have to I, be benevolent Right. I would think they would, would be affiliated with the Earth Alliance. Right, and especially... I'm not with, sure which, which races. The Earth Alliance is referred to in hushed tones and respectful, and I don't know who they are. Mm. But they 
have been trying to protect the planet from outsiders for millions of years. So I'm just going to ask you the real serious, hardcore question. And I know Rex is going to jump in here in a second. And I'm sure Zach's going to follow up. So Nibiru is the 10th planet. It, you know, is an elliptical orbit. Its orbital passage is every 3,600 or 3,500 and change years or whatever. How close, and before I ask you how close is, I personally believe living in Southern California, that something is going on. Rex and I have had this conversation. There's much more intense solar radiation now. The air is different. When I go outside in the sun in Southern California with my wife and we feel the sun's rays, we're like, what in the hell is going on? It feels like a microwave zapping. It's the most bizarre thing. So there's clearly new cosmic or solar or you know um, some form of radiation in the atmosphere right now. It's increasing. Is this because of Nibiru? its orbital passage and also it's all the other bodies that are in its orbital, you know, uh, trajectory. Um, and is it, is it close? And, and what does it portend for us as a species on this planet? Is someone, the earth Alliance, are they battling to prevent a worldwide calamity? You know, the, the poles flipping, you know, all the things that they've talked about in the past is it, are they trying to prevent an extinction level event? That I don't know. I do know that the military industrial complex has been using HARP technology to prevent precipitation in the Western United States because, right. because they say it interferes with their communication systems. And that's why we had drought in California for so long. Right. And there's a website that monitors harp, frequent harp, uh, yeah. the amount of it. Right. And when it shows there being a ring over my part of the state, my head feels like it's going to explode. So I'm going to think that that radiation is what you're experiencing from the sun. So it's, why is it so intense though now when, I mean, I'm very sensitive to the sun and I go out in the sun, I'm a you know, very active person in my life and whatnot. It's like in my work, my line of work, I'm out and about all the time. So I'm very sensitive to these things. And I have sensed, you know, as I told Gerald and of course Zach and Rex, I've been sensing this intense solar radiation for about four months now, and it's literally getting more intense by the day. So, I, and, and again, I'm witnessing very strange climactic patterns. There's a lot of people probably watching right here that are in Southern California. I've seen some people agree. Um, like we've had bizarre clouds. Climatic. You know, I, I've seen very strange weather, like in the last, again, in the last couple of weeks, I'm not saying, but we've had really low cloud cover bizarre sun, very yellow, hazy, you know, white sun. Mm -hmm. And again, this intense solar, I guess my, my question is, is and, and you've already answered it pretty much. You don't know, but I mean, do you believe that there is, that Nibiru is out there and that it is coming by or it's close to coming by around the earth? Yeah, I do. So what, so um, what, well, what do you think is going to happen? I think Nibiru's presence is what's causing the global warming. Okay. Um, I believe its presence is also what's causing the the earthquakes to be more extreme Massive for there to numbers, right. for there to be more volcanoes and I and for the Inuit in Alaska to be saying there's been a shift in this where the stars are the planet has moved right. so this is from Nibiru now. I haven't seen official numbers on where it is right now, but my feeling is that it's getting closer. I don't know how close it's going to hit to Earth, but I do know that Edgar Casey talked about a pole flip in this time for time zone. Right. So do you do you so you don't have any contact with your handlers? or anyone in this in the secret space program or the dark fleet or any of the places that you've been that have given you forewarnings about anything that's to come what i've been hearing from my handler 
is this voice in my head saying, why aren't you dead yet? Hmm. That's not exactly informative. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, I get it. So you don't, you don't think, so I, I mean, again, I'll just put you on the spot. Do, do you feel that the earth and the populations on this planet and humanity and where we're at right now, do you think that there's massive danger impending? Yes. But it's as much from our own elite as it is from Nibiru. So your guess is, your guess is, and Zach and Rex, please jump in here, but your guess is that we'll, we'll bomb ourselves to the Stone Ages before Nibiru does anything to us. I think that when Nibiru hits, that we'll bomb ourselves into the Stone Ages. And that all that will be left are the colonies off world. Hmm. Under yeah. five years, longer than five years from happening or under? The impression I've gotten from psychic sources is under five years. Fascinating. Rex, uh, Zach, jump in here. Yeah, I was wonder I'm wondering about since we're we're thinking about Nibiru's passage so much and how it's going to affect us on Earth, I'm wondering what these other species on their planets are are doing to prevent catastrophe on their planets and what's going on with them. Um, I don't know if you get any readings or, or messages from them on how they deal with it. And also, the other thing that's coming to my mind, uh, Jay, is that paper that you sent me that's supposed to be the message from Enki. I know he's talking about how, they, how they're developing this technology and having this war to be able to use it to stop the poles from flipping like that. Right. Um, I can't remember what that paper was, but... Yeah, Matt, Matt, Matt sent it to me and then I sent it to you, but yeah. So, I mean, so Matt, Matt LaCroix, our, our great trusty friend who's traveling and not on the podcast tonight, and Gerald is also um, indisposed. He's doing some stuff in Mexico tonight, but um, he's been saying that the only thing that's going to protect us is the, the, the good forces of the Anunnaki and the light beings, maybe the Earth Alliance or whatever, are diligently working with similar weather and, and geodidactic you know, technology to prevent the poles from shifting, to prevent whatever normally happens when Nibiru does its passage. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know. I, it's hard to know who to believe or understand anything these days, but. It's a big leap of hope. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, it's, it, it's interesting though to listen to you, Penny, because again, I, I find you a fountain of knowledge. Um, and, I, and I'll just say it to everybody that's listening and watching to this right now. I 100% believe Penny. Um, I, I don't, you know, whether she's, um, you know, a robot who's had chips implanted in her, <laughs> the real human being who's been age regressed a hundred times or 20 times or six times or whatever. I mean, this is a person who clearly knows her stuff. I mean, again, and I, I have no problem sharing this with everybody who's going to be watching this. I've had many conversations with Penny. The very first time that Penny and I met each other, she attacked me and asked me if I was a white supremacist. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, well, actually, no, but you know, I'd like to get to know you better. Uh, so, so Penny and I go way back now, and I believe her story, and I, I, I'm the same as Zach. I, I, I wholeheartedly thank her for coming on tonight. She is a very courageous soul, and I just hope that this can motivate other people, people like herself to step forward and out of the shadows and, and share their stories, right? Because that's the only way we can break the silence of these sons of bitches that are in control of this planet and, and, and in control of this solar system. And, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, you, any, you guys have any follow-up thoughts? I want to answer a couple more questions for Penny, but um, Rex, any thoughts? Yes, I'd like to add one thing about the radiation and make sure to let me give a shout out before we close out tonight. The radiation levels I've been keeping track of since 2013. I've got a military grade Geiger counter watch that I take with me just about everywhere. It's a badass watch. It looks awesome. pretty darn cool and it keeps track of the radiation levels. So how cool is that? As a matter of fact, let me get this thing going back on again. I'll show you what I'm referring to. Um, so we've got this set up right now I and mean, the radiation levels if you can see that, we're at 0.1 microsieverts per hour. At 0.1 microsieverts per hour, that's approximately 30% higher than it used to be on a regular basis here in San Antonio. In 2013, when wow. I picked up this watch, it hovered around 0.07 microsieverts per hour. Now, some days you'll see it at 0.14 or even higher. 
I've wow. traveled the country quite extensively and the radiation levels jump up and down quite a bit. And Southern Texas levels are about three times as high. One time I was in Atlanta, they jumped 300%. But here's the craziest thing. When I flew to Anchorage, Alaska in 2013, <laughs> oh man, I wish I had this on film. The radiation levels went from 0 0.07 to 4.2. Wow. 4.2 microsieverts per hour in the air when I flew to Anchorage, Alaska. And another cool anomaly one time when I went to Devil's Tower in Wyoming. Beautiful, beautiful out there. I'd strongly recommend Devil's Towers. They film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It's just this crazy volcanic anomaly in the middle of nowhere. And the radiation levels outside of that park were the lowest I've ever seen. They were as low as 0 0.04 when I went right up to the tower and I, and I put my hand up on the tower like that. The radiation levels were at 0.6, so they had gone up 15 times when I was touching the tower there. And I made a comment to uh, to my mom about that actually, and she's not a conspiracy theorist. She's really down to earth. When I say conspiracy theorist, she just she's more mainstream. I think conspiracy theorists are brilliant. I mean that's why we are conspiracy theorists because we right. don't follow the mainstream. But regardless, I'm digressing here. I, I brought that up to her. I was like, you know, the radiation levels how they increase so much, and she said, well, don't UFOs leave radiation? when they have like, you know, certain landings and stuff like that, they've checked the radiation levels, they were far higher. And I thought about that and I was like, yeah, you know what, you're right. So uh, you never know, there could be a base underground there with some reptilian shapeshifters. Bingo. <laughs> Big time. Thanks, man. Um, so I'm going to answer more questions, Zach. Um, final thoughts real quick before we answer a couple more questions for Penny. Oh, wow, that was, that was an amazing story once again. Uh, I have, a, I have a lot of thoughts going through my head, but I think I think maybe we should give the the dot member some opportunity to maybe okay. get some questions in the penny. Okay, so Penny, I'm just going to give you some questions, some rapid fire ones. Um, one person asked, there's so many. I'm going from memory before I look up at the screen. One person asked, how many people that are like you? You know, you claim that there's a million of you guys out there on Earth right now. How many of you are diagnosed? mentally ill or schizophrenic or bipolar or MPD? I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on that? A lot of us are too paranoid to go in and be diagnosed. Um, a lot of us are homeless. Um, a lot of us are um, unable to have normal relationships. Um, a lot of us are having weird flashbacks that we have no clue what they're what they're about. And my impression is that the regular government wants to keep it that way because if we don't remember, we can't Im implicate them. Good answer. Here's another one. I'm just going to rapid fire you. For people who are not yet aware that they were part of the program, what would you say are some very key symptoms or telltale signs to look for? That's a good question. Alters. Um, okay, you would have missing time, especially when you were a child. You would have times that you were abducted and you would think it was ETs, but it's really American military in ET costumes. Um, you would have dreams of going down a dark tunnel with bright lights every so far down the ceiling. Um, you would be afraid of boats. You would be afraid of jeeps. You would be afraid of small aircraft. Um, you would be claustrophobic, um, afraid of elevators. Um, some, of, some of us have real revulsion for reptiles. Um, a lot of your snake haters out there. Oh my God, my mom is a massive snake hater. Um, but the biggie is, is missing time. Fascinating. Um, so I'm just going to keep going. So are people like yourself, are you picked by blood type or is it genetic? 
I was picked because my mother was descended from Henry VIII. Um, and my father was Native American. And the Native Americans and Jews and Aryans all have higher psi abilities, native. And that and that is that from bloodlines? Yeah. Okay, so the next question is follows up to that. It says, does everyone who has an O blood, O my o, o negative blood have family connection to the Anunnaki before you answer? And are also people with negative blood types like uh, o negative are they more likely to be abducted and if so who is who is it what race specifically is doing the abducting i know you just said it's the military but is there a race behind that military presence that are abducting um in my generation they took o negative mothers because that was the only combination that worked for the technology was an O negative mother with an O positive child. Um, they seem to have gotten past that since then. But in my age range, people born in the 50s and early 60s, that was the only one that worked. Um, the technology was developed by the Germans in World War II, um, actually before World War II, because they had a whole, a whole battalion of clones right i've read that and so they already had that technology no, in fact the, those that clone army was in was sent to antarctica before the end of world war ii right i don't know what happened to them i've seen photographs of them but i don't know what happened to them yeah, i've read some stories from some of the great researchers alternative researchers that said that they were sent on u-boats and that there was literally like for a force of four hundred thousand sent to sent there and then you know as you said the Vril and the dark fleet you know they had technology in the late 20s and 30s i mean there's a lot of people on earth as you know jim mars is one of them joseph patrick farrell joseph patrick farrell and i are buddies um that cool i've never met him i read was, his book <laughs> awesome guy I'll, I'll happy to introduce you to him but they're um you know those both of those guys believe that the nazis are still in control and that's echoing essentially what you're saying right because the dark fleet the Nazis are in control right. um, with um, Operation High Jump. America lost. Right. And, and that, there's a question about that. I was going to go right to that. So um, we lost and the Germans in Antarctica, Neuschwabenland, right. they sent their rocket, their um, the, Hanab the Hanabu, right? The Hanabu, right? Yeah, they sent their saucers to basically show the American government, right. we can attack you anywhere, anytime, any time we want to. And by the time that Eisenhower was out of office, by the time Kennedy was elected, they were in charge of the United States. Right, like all and, those all those saucer flyovers in D.C. in the 50s was all mm -hmm. Nazi technology. Yes, Awesome. Um, all right, a couple more questions and we're going to wrap it up. Um, In fact, the current election is basically nonsense because the Germans are running the place. So let me ask, exactly. <laughs> so, so I guess last couple of questions. Um, so we, you know, Rex is a big, big student of the, uh, the, 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 the Nag Hammadi and the Archons and the Gnostics and stuff. And I am too. And I know you're familiar with them too. We didn't talk at all about the Archons and the Archontic parasitic creatures, you know, and obviously all of us, on our show have talked about the dark brotherhood and the sons of Belial and these, you know, entities that exist and inhabit beings here on earth, probably a lot of our political leaders and whatnot, but, what do you know of the archons? And then we'll just end the show on that. I mean, what, what, what are you aware of them? My, my awareness of them is that they are plasmoid beings from another dimension. So they are what the government would call alien. ETs are physical and aliens are inter interdimensional. Um, I don't know how long they've been here, but it's been a long, long time. 
and they uh, are parasitic and they can uh, they can literally take over a human host correct they can take over and they feed off of negative emotional energy so as rex yeah. said so as rex said i don't mean to interrupt you but i want you to keep going but as rex said in the last show all of us have are invaded by archons when we feel emotional anger negativity right i mean are, are they that's mm -hmm. what they're attracted to it's like the light it's like a moth to a flame correct um if you have a lot of light you don't even have to be negative for them to feed off of you wow um, so the so the people so the more aware of us like the people in our group we're actually a bigger beacon to them than people of lower vibration yeah jesus yeah are you, are you getting this zach this is fascinating stuff man they, yeah. they, they they the more energy you have the more they can feed off of you and it's not just one i've since waking up i can see them on people and there are people that are just literally covered with them where there's no light getting through at all. I saw one, Monica and I saw one this afternoon. We went to a house and we were listing a property and the husband was being divorced by this woman and she had cheated on him. And little did we know that she was down the street and one of the kids went and got her and she came into the house and she literally was the most astonishing thing I've ever seen. Monica and I literally, when we left the house, she deep six the whole deal. And when we left the house, she, she her face was literally vacant. There was no human life in her body. And we yeah. both said we both said we want to go home and like do the circle chant because we felt like there was so much much <laughs> so much darkness around us that if anything it could have just jumped right off of her into us. But I mean, I I've seen it, um, I've seen it for sure in my life. I have oh, no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah. Um. So what you, so so you're saying they attract when you're negative. You have this like low vibration. So when something horrible happens to you in your life, they're also it's also an opportunity for them to go and gravitate towards you and feed off of you, correct? Because they're getting that negative energy. Um, they arrange for things to happen to you so that they can do it. Wow. So they can actually they can actually prevent certain things in our reality to feed off of us. Yes. How easy is it to get rid of them? I've been, I've been able to remove them. I have more trouble removing their implants. Um, I had to have, I can get the archons themselves off of people rather easily and they don't come back. But um, most people seem to have a hard time with it. So, so when you say they, they, they have technology, are they are they aligned with any of these other quote unquote you know ET or other interdimensional beings? Or are they separate and they have their own initiatives? They to me they seem to be separate and have their own agenda. But I've heard about them being allied with Anlil and Marduk. That would make sense. Mm -hmm. so, Man, all this has got to make you think to really bring awareness into your present moment constantly and, and learn to control your thoughts. It's funny because I was literally just making that compilation video of Gerald's uh, on an right. Nibiru lecture and he's talking about this stuff like become aware of your thoughts because those are going to become your actions and go into your character. Um, and so it's Penny, how would you know, I, I'm sorry, Zach, you're, no, no. this is so mind blowing and there's so many questions coming in. How would you know if you had an Archon implant or tech in you? Assume you do. So almost every person most likely has them. So, it, so, it, it's one of the rules for coming into the planet is that you have to have their implants. And they start off as teardrop shaped they almost they almost look like like rubber teardrops and they're they're dark and um <clears throat> they grow with you and they form these hair hair things they're in between hairs and wires and they're fourth dimensional not three dimensional I but i had one in my brain that was so big that it uh, it showed as an empty place on an MRI. 
And that was the most freaky thing I have ever seen. And the amazing thing is the neurologist says, oh, you have advanced cerebral atrophy and you're going to be dead in, in three years. So go take care of your, your business. <laughs> that was 10 years ago. <laughs> so so and it's funny. Here and I still make sense when I talk. <laughs> well, Mo Mo Monica had a, um, a fibroid tumor in her uterus, you know, that they did an MRI on when we first got together like two years ago. And they even showed us the picture of it, you know, the radiolis radiolis screen and it, it had teeth and hair. It was, it was nasty. And mm -hmm. I'm completely not kidding you. Five months later, it was gone. And both of us were kind of astonished and like, this is a weird anomaly. What the hell's going on? And again, you know, this is three years ago, but I mean, you know, when I hear stuff like that, you kind of think like, wow, you know, so I mean, they're, so we're all born with them. So like what makes them react or go off and set us off? And, you know, cause I know, and I've, I've said this before, I've had this conversation with Rex. I've had this conversation with uh, Zach and Gerald and Matt. All of us are capable of unbelievable rage and anger, right? Mm -hmm. There's times when we just don't know why we act like complete morons. Mm -hmm. And my guess is always, right. And, but my guess has always been that there is some force and, clearly where we're going with this is that would be what it is that does feed off of our adrenaline and this biological cascade when we get angry and our testosterone spikes or our estrogen or whatever and all those things are happening so it makes a lot of logical sense here and stands to reason that this is what's happening that they are feeding and as they feed it sets up more adrenaline cortisol and all these other biological cascades mm -hmm. to make us react emotionally and irrationally would you agree i agree that the archons are behind most of that some of it is just out of control humans who are also addicted to their own adrenaline so, so the next most, question is, most of it is is archons so the next question so the next question is then so are they really in control of our rulers of our political structure are they in control of pretty much all of the power hungry power mad people on earth um they would be in charge of they would be controlling the individuals rather than the structure um the structure is more anunnaki and alpha draconian um so the anunnaki and the alpha draconian don't give a rat's ass about the archons not not really no this place truly is a prison planet. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up. I don't, there's so many good questions, but guys, we can't answer them all. Oh, oh, so one last question, and then I want Rex and, and Zach to have final thoughts. You know, and, and again, Penny Weeks, I, I don't know how to describe how excited I am for you to tell us all this stuff. I mean, I, it's negative stuff, but it's amazing, and we appreciate it. But um, the last question is, how can, we, how can we prevent, what can we do as humans right now you know, going into nature, meditation, you know, um, mindfulness, what kind of stuff can we do right now to ward off the archons or to try to stay archon free? Oh, gee. Um, stay in control of your thoughts, like, like Zach said. Um, try to stay in a zone where you're not reacting to things. Um, not exactly disassociation, but as close as you can get and still feel what's happening. Um, the more in control of your reactions you are, the calmer you are, the less they have negative stuff to feed off. Um, the more light you have, that attracts different ones of them. So um, those, there's not a whole, whole lot you can do about. Um, except stay aware of your own energy field and pick them off as they show up. Okay, it's Rex, Rex, Rex and, and uh, Zach, final thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Real quick, I just want to say, you know, Penny, thanks for coming on. It was real nice to speak with you. You got into some pretty personal stuff. And like you said, this could make 99% of the people out there 
I think, wow, what is this lady talking about? And just the fact that you're willing to spend your time with us here, I think that says a lot. Zach, Thanks. go ahead, brother. Uh, again, uh, you know, thank you for having me again on the show, and and thank you, Penny, for coming on the show. I know that I read in the um, in the comments before the show that you were feeling a little bit nervous, um, and I and I kind of and I kind of felt um, what you were feeling when I first came on the show, and I have to say that you did amazing on the show today, and uh, you know I commend you for that. Um, Thank you, know, you. You, came, you came with so much information. Um, I think uh, obviously Jay is going to want to have you back on the show because I think, you know, there's so many questions that we didn't even get to just from the members. Um, so I think you have a lot more to share with us and you definitely have my mind spinning. So I'm going to have trouble sleeping tonight because I'm going to be thinking about everything that you said. Um, so I just want to thank you from my heart for, uh, for coming out with this information and, and thank you very much. Yeah, and I'll just final, um, you know, Penny, you were spectacular. There was no nervousness, no shaky. You were lucid, very clear. You know, there were some tough questions that we asked you, and, you know, you paused and you reflected and you thought deeply. And, again, I, I have to say this, you know, to all the people that are still watching on Facebook, we got a big crowd. Um, this has been an amazing, if not astonishing interview. She covered a wide swath of topics. She is incredibly enlightened and knowledgeable about a lot of different things. Um, and honestly, I just consider it an honor for you to come on our show. And again, we're definitely going to have you on again, Penny, because again, as Zach, Zach said, and of course, Rex echoed, there's just so many things that you broached tonight that we really weren't able to give enough time to, but you, you know, it's really weird because it seems like the more enlightened people and the more people with light and you do have light. And I know you've been through a harrowing experience in your life and you've been tortured and all this other horrible shit by the worst humans or non-humans or whatever, both. Um, but you have a lot of light in you and you have an amazing soul and everyone that watches this show and has been listening tonight live knows that that's the case. Again, I just, I can't thank you enough. And, Encourage more people like you. For those of you guys in the Decoders of Truth, okay, and I know there are some of you in there because Penny has told me about you, please come out and share your story, okay? It's important that more and more humans around this planet wake the F up. There's too many people asleep. There's too many people who have no earthing clue of what is going on, and it's our job in the Decoders of Truth to awake people and do it, do our best to help. And, and just, you know, again, Penny's information is just so phenomenal. I can't imagine, you know, Zach, when you edit this, I mean, this has just been mind blowing to me. I agree with Zach. I'm completely spinning. Um, I can't wait to go home and talk to Monica about it. But again, Penny, thank you so much. You were fabulous. You have any final thoughts? Be good to the people in your life. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. And again, thank you to Lou too. I know he was in the background a couple times, but thank you for, for, you know, for supporting you and to give you, you know, to be, to be the man I'm sure that he is to be in your life for the last 15 years. And again, we're definitely going to have you on again. So once again, thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.